ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮ ಹರಿ ಹಿ ಓಂ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನನ್ನ ಹೃತ್ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾದ ವಂದನೆಗಳು ಸಬ್ಕಾ ಹಾರ್ದಿಕ್ ಸ್ವಾಗತ್ ಶುಭೋದಯ ಶುಭ ದಿನ್ ಶುಭ ಸಂಧ್ಯಾ ಆನ್ ಬಿಹಾಫ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೆಸ್ಟೀಜಿಯಸ್ ರಾಜೀವ್ ಗಾಂಧಿ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ರೋಣ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಜಿ ಎಸ್ ಪಾಟೀಲ್ ಸರ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆನರರಿ ಸೆಕ್ರೆಟರಿ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆ ಪಿ ಧನ್ನೂರ್ ಸರ್ ಚೇರ್ಮನ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಐ ಎಸ್ ಪಾಟೀಲ್ ಸರ್ ಎವರ್ ಎನ್ಕರೇಜಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸಿಪಲ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಐ ಬಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟೂರ್ ಶೆಟ್ಟಿ ಸರ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸಿಂಗ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪಿ ಜಿ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕಾಯ ಚಿಕಿತ್ಸಾ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ಸ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆನಂದ್ ಎಂ ಆದಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಿವಕುಮಾರ್ ಸಿ ಸರ್ವಿ ಸರ್ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ಸ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ರಾಘವೇಂದ್ರ ಪಿ ಶೆಟ್ಟಾರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಅನುಪೂರ್ಣ ಎಸ್ ಡಂಬಾಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮೈಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಾರದಾ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಕೋರ್ಡಿನೇಟರ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಶಿಕಲ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಶಿಕಲಾ ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಬಾನಿ ಮೇಡಮ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಸ್ಟಾಫ್ ಆಫ್ ರಾಜೀವ್ ಗಾಂಧಿ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟೀಸ್ ಆಯುರ್ವೇದಿಕ್ ಮೆಡಿಕಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಪಿ ಜಿ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ರೋನ್ ಹಾರ್ಟಿಲಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಅವರ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಎಮಿನೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಅವರ್ ವ್ಯೂಯರ್ಸ್ ಹೂಸ್ ಇನ್ವಾಲ್ವ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಅನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪಿರೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಡೇ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಜೂನ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಟುಡೇ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಡೇ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಐ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಟು ಜಾಯಿನ್ ಮೀ ಇನ್ ದ ಪ್ರೇಯರ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ದ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ನಮಿ ಧನ್ವಂತರಿ ಮಾದಿದೇವ ಸುರಾಸುರೈರ್ವಂದಿತ ಪಾದಪದ್ಮ ಲೋಕೆ ಜರಾರುಭಯ ಮೃತ್ಯುನಾಶ ದಾತಾರಮೀಶಂ ವಿವಿಧೌಷಧೀನ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 latest report says that india has reached the sixth position in the world in the count of covid-19 patients which is quite alarming so i think uh, our prayers are not sufficient enough so i request that all the uh, all over the world everyone should pray very seriously to god almighty and all as well i request all the ayurveda vaidyas present here try hard to increase the vyadhi kshamatva of the society without wasting much time let's continue no words for me today as sir dr rangesh parmesh sir is my teacher is the speaker today many of his students would be watching live to see him they were very anxious in fact then listen and which we have missed for a long time he is a great teacher a great personality and above all he is a very great human being about sir in brief 
He is presently Chief Scientific Officer, Himalaya Global Management Limited, BIFC, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Sir joined Research and Development Center of the Himalaya Drug Company as a medical advisor, a prestigious company, rose to senior level and led the drug discovery at Bengaluru and now in, is Global CSO, headquartered at Dubai. He is heading R&D labs both in Bengaluru and Dubai. He is serving the company for over two decades. He was an Ayurvedic cons Ayurveda consultant in Switzerland, Germany, Italy, and UK, involved in establishing Ayurveda clinics in Europe. He has conducted periodic Ayurveda seminars in Germany, Switzerland, Mauritius, UK, UAE, Muscat, Ecuador, Singapore, Malaysia, China, Mongolia, and Turkmenistan, almost the whole world. He has covered for physician in Western medicine. He began his career as a university teacher at Government Ayurveda Medical College in Bengaluru and as well Mysuru, and taught in the field of Ayurvedic pharmacology and pharmaceutics, as well as a research guide to postgraduate studies for over 15 years. He is a graduate and postgraduate MD Ayurveda in the Department of Rasashastra Bhaisheche Kalpana, which was earlier there, in, um, from Bengaluru University. He is an alumnus of very prestigious institute, Indian Institute of Management, Bengaluru. He has published several articles in Indian and international journals and has written several books. Dr. Rangesh sir has co-authored five chapters in Scientific Basis of Ayurveda, Ayurvedic Therapy, CRC Press, Florida, USA. Sir has given several seminars and workshops to the learned societies and conferences in India and abroad on Ayurveda, and healthy lifestyle changes and has addressed IT professionals and young entrepreneurs, college students, housewives, and people of all walks of life. Sir was conferred fellowship of Royal Asiatic Society London in 1999. He was bestowed Purna Swasthya Award from World Federation of Societies of Holistic Medicine, Italy in 1991, Hamsa Puraskara Award from Hamsa Jyoti, Bengaluru in 1999, Vocational Excellence Award from Rotary Club Bangalore Orchards for High Ethical Standards, Excellence and Integrity in Ayurveda Medical Practice in 2006. He also is a member of the Board of Advisors Wellness and Health Tourism Expo 2013, Bengaluru. To add, finally, he is one who has initiated research methodology to many students like me way back from 1989-90. Without taking much of all of your time, let me start the most important event of today. Uh, I request uh, my respected sir, Rangesh Parme sir, to start his lecture. Sir, please. So friends, uh, Namaskar, Namaste. So welcome you all uh, for this presentation. I'm very thankful to Professor Sharada for inviting me to deliver this talk and share my views. And to the Honorable Principal of Rajiv Gandhi Education Society, side with the Medical College and Hospital, Ron, Professor Iredna, and all the uh, staff, the faculty of the college and the organizers of this uh, wonderful event, the international webinar on Trividham Aushadham. In fact, when uh, Professor Sharda called me a few days back when they were planning about last week, uh, she asked me to participate in this uh, webinar which is now being the order of the day. Uh, maybe thanks to the, uh, the COVID situation wherein we are able to connect the whole world virtually and at uh, no cost, a dissemination of the knowledge, information and education is happening through this technology. In fact, 
this is in a, a revolution by itself so today i am going to talk on evidence based ayurvedic medicine if you have seen in the recent times when the covid pandemic started the the situation where particularly in india and elsewhere in the world because of uh, lack of availability of an established treatment modality either the drugs or the methods because it has been considered to be a very new a pandemic and no established drugs are available so everything has started empirically with the rational being developed on repurposing of previous drugs if you look anti malarial drug is repurposed here and because of not having the evidence of any drug in the treatment of uh, this covid situation so the whole focus of the world and more so in india and as well you know who has been voicing well on this is to identify methods programs guidelines on how to improve one's own immunity because of the lack of available drugs for this so it is what is better is at least to save the population by enhancing their innate immunity to fight this disease i am sure friends you recognize very well that ayush has been in the limelight today for this very one important innate strength of enhancing immunity if you if you ask now how uh, this thought of ayush participating in enhancing the immunity of the population against this disease by using several methods of uh, making teas and decoctions of different herbs which fortunately in the recent times have been studied very well around the world for their what is called as immunomodulatory activity thanks to the situation that ayush is in the limelight today but yet you find the lot of um, the debate that's happening on one important theme called where is the evidence for these claims of your ayush helping enhancing the immunity of an individual to fight this disease so in this context i feel it is appropriate that in this seminar on tribidam aushadam as you know it has been a hallmark or a gold standard if you want to call it as in ayurveda for the treatment of diseases this the tribidam aushadam as it looks the one of the important uh, the tripod of this tribidam aushadam being the yukti vipassana the yukti itself is talking about the rationality and the rationality is developed by evidence not by any other means it's not an intuition the other two being being questioned or being asked for evidence and how does it really help and truly beneficial so in this context i think uh, this uh, talk uh, is most appropriate on how we go future you have heard for the last 5 days on uh, various aspects of these three the limbs of the treatment that i would could offer which is uh, considered to be if you employ all the all of them together it is what is expected to be a holistic approach 
it has been a, a situation of debate of uh, two group of people, one who is supporting it and the other one is questioning it. So I have divided my talk. The first way, let us talk about the current scenario, particularly on the call for evidence of any modality that we are trying to propose from Ayurveda wisdom. So one important aspect which has been talked for the last uh, four decades about the right way to practice medicine has been this evidence-based medicine, what's popularly known as EBM. Although it's a very recent concept, since late 80s, 1980s, it has been a, a very important aspect to establish the rationality in medical practice, which I'm sure that you will recognize what was Ayurveda's wisdom for this aspect of evidence-based medicine. Then I will move on to Ayurvedic medicine. I wanted you to ponder over the difference that exists between the two words called as Ayurveda and Ayurvedic medicine. I'm going to restrict myself only to Ayurvedic medicine, but not Ayurveda. And then we will move on what we need to do in this scenario that the evidence that is existing in the past and what is currently that we are getting it around the world, and what, how much it is and what we need to do next. Then finally, how this evidence is documented. And I always uh, been very subscribed to this view, the publish or perish. We have a lot of evidence, we have a lot of thoughts, a lot of experiences, observations, and successes in the treatment. But if it is not recorded, it is not published, the knowledge, the individual, all the efforts that we wanted to support Ayurveda, strengthen Ayurveda, will be a futile exercise and one will perish. So let us look at the current scenario. You know, when, as I said, when Ayush came to the forefront, in the limelight, in the front lines of claims of enhancing immunity, we have seen a lot of media carrying articles, debates, and views, and writings on. And on the, uh, the validity of these claims. With all this, government of India has made a very strong effort to push very hard, very hard. Now, the Hindu had carried in one of its uh, health columns, big claims, little evidence. When the Ayush guidelines was issued in India, what they need to follow, what are those, you know, quath, Ayush quath as it is popularly now, now known as, and then hygiene, hygienic methods that what WH was enforcing all over the world. Now, how do we do it in an Ayurvedic way? Everybody, every media person started writing their own thoughts and views and one of them here, as you can see on the left side, big claims, little evidence. Scanned data exists to back government claims of the efficacy of some Ayurvedic drugs. Just like that. Scanned data. Is the data truly scanned enough for this individually, if not combination? And definitely anybody, even till today, is not able to claim a strong evidence for this COVID. But still, people want to comment. So again, 
there is what is known as push and pull mechanism that's ha- that's happening even to to today that the ayush department wants to push that there is a, quite enough evidence it has been recorded in ages and practice and a very long standing evidence for this but still uh, the media wants to pull saying that it doesn't have any evidence in uh, john hopkins in the united states john hopkins uh, school of medicine uh, in the university john hopkins university even today considered as uh, the nodal center for mapping the world statistics on the covid situation that is the most authentic you get the uh, the most uh, accurate and up to date there in their web page they have a section they have integrative medicine as well and then they have a section on ayurveda and what is ayurveda to describe is what this write up is uh, being written i have just marked that one paragraph many ayurvedic materials have not been thoroughly studied in either western or indian research look at this some of the products used in ayurvedic medicine contain herbs minerals and all those things that may be harmful if used improperly or without the direction of a trained practitioner it looks that they are trying to translate charakas sir excuse me sir yeah i am shanta here sir can yeah. I, are you screen sharing sir because we are not able to see actually oh, really ah uh, sir then how is this i'm not sharing uh uh-huh. oh very sad so that top screen share uh, oh i'm so sorry okay. i was showing this yes now it's visible ah uh, now it's visible sir ah uh, you can cut sir enlarge it yes now now it's visible yes sir yes sir ah uh, now it's visible oh, i'm sorry i thought it was you are all seeing that okay uh i was talking about that hindu article that everybody has read but if you look at this uh, uh i was talking about john hopkins uh, page on ayurveda is is talking about what is ayurveda and i was i do the materials and it is harmful and if you look at this so that maybe uh, you know some of the products used in ayurvedic medicine contain herbs metals minerals and other materials that may be harmful if used improperly or without the direction of a trained practitioner so it's something like it looks as if charakas uh, sutra thana first chapter 71st shloka he was talking about you know, if you know all about this drug having all evidences knowledge about this and use it judiciously it becomes what is known as an ambrosia even if it is a poison even if it is a poison it's classified to be but even if it is a medicine not known properly and not studied not having evidence it turns out to be poison so what matters the difference is the knowledge knowledge in the form of evidence similarly that you find many many opinions this in news 18 opinion you know anybody you have the freedom of uh, expression rights to express the thoughts that you find so efficacy of ayurveda is far from proven data being manipulated to show desired results on humans look at this allegation even the data has been manipulated so how much uh, the effort that has been made to show that there is not enough data and even if there is data it is always manipulated just because to promote you you have uh, many of you have seen probably this particular debate on ndtv in the uh, the early part of this time i just want you to follow this carefully this video and then we will talk about what is missing here The health minister's proposal to push for Ayurveda in institutes like AIMS has sparked off a fierce debate. Many doctors are unhappy, saying there isn't enough research to back up the claims, while others have called it a political move by the BJP. The question is whether these concerns are justified. Bhairavi Singh has more. Now, all over the world, it is accepted that holistic medicine 
has to be the order of the day and there has to be an integration between all the systems of medicine Union Health Minister Harshvardhan defending his decision to have an Ayurveda department in each of the six new aims coming up country wide His plan is to give not just Ayurveda but also yoga homeopathy Unani and Siddha pride of place in the aims system Though the minister has himself described the decision as an attempt to get global acceptance for the ancient Indian system as evidence-based medicine, support for it from the traditional medical fraternity even within India has been far from forthcoming. Ayurveda supporters though have welcomed the government's plan. There are a number of situations where Ayurveda has been shown to be very effective. People's confidence will grow only if there is evidence. As such, it's a philosophy, and we integrate both as well as modern medicine as well as Ayurveda in our practice, and we are getting very good results. Interestingly, the government's plan was first announced by the minister when laying the foundation stone of Yoga Guru Baba Ramdev's Global Museum of Ayurveda and Herbal Medicine in Haridwar. Ramdev under investigation for tax evasion by the previous government is the best known proponent of ayurveda in the country today and runs a drug firm patanjali an ayurveda firm Harshavardhan's colleagues in parliament allege that the plan has more to do with politics than science I mean in under the act already allopathy ayurveda alternative forms of medicine are all recognized but if the object is to kind of give a slant to it and I am not saying at the moment because I have not seen the context of the statement then it would be wrong There are also concerns that this may increase cross-pathy, the practice of one system of medicine by a person trained in another, something that was banned by the Supreme Court in 1996. With Bhairavi Singh and Sandeep Pokan, Ankita Mukherjee for NDTV. So is it okay to go the Ayurveda way? It's quite an interesting debate. And joining us on the panel this evening, we have Dr. Naresh Trehan, the founder chairman of Medanta. Also with us, Dr. Avnish Seth with Fortis Healthcare. Narin Kohli still here in the studios with us. And also joining us tonight from Bangalore, Dr. Gigi Gangadharan, the medical director of the Institute of Ayurvedic and Integrative Medicine. Let me ask Dr. Trehan first that many doctors at AIMS who you speak to privately will say that the problem with Ayurveda is that it's not substantiated properly by modern day research. Now, do you share those concerns? Do you believe that doc- what Dr. Harshvardhan is proposing is is something we're not ready for? No, it's not that simplistic. The question is, I can speak with some authority because I am the highest practitioner of modern medicine. That modern medicine is effective most of the time. It has certain limitations. One, the principles are that either we will give a poison to kill the bacteria or cancer, or we will do surgery for to remove the diseased organ, or we will shoot it with the most powerful radiation beam to kill cancer cells. Very effective, very invasive to the human body, and expensive. So, if you juxtapose it now, India. where we have 1.2 billion people where even the all this stuff is invented in the US and Europe where America cannot afford its own medicine we have a compulsion here to say what is it that will bring that level of medicine or cure or prevention to our people that they deserve every man standing on the ground deserves that so one Ayurveda is not a new science it's it it functioned in this world for several thousand years and kept people going the limitations are definitely there in the sense that we don't understand the actual mode of action the active ingredient and what it act, what predictably it will do so the issues with us right now are that one i think that there is a huge and i and we are actually have medanta part of medanta is a huge ayurvedic research going on to co- to integrate the two or fuse the two medicines because i believe that if we do the proper research if we go through all the toxicity and the f- efficacy of ayurveda in different uh, forms and combine them with modern medicine we may have a new medicine coming out of india the new era medicine which will be equally or more effective than modern medicine it will be imminently so less invasive point. You're, and you're much cheaper you think there needs to be an open mind on this and you are you're, you're, you're already yeah. d- trying to do that so dr said uh, i believe you have some some very strong concerns on on this issue uh, what are your concerns because the dr trehan says that you know you need to have more research into this yes there are limitations but maybe there is something that can come out of this uh, in, in integrated uh, work what do you think see i am for holistic medicine and as dr trehan said <coughs> if we have a proper research and we can show some randomized trials showing benefit why not 
But my concern is I am a gastro and liver specialist and I get patients with side effects because of Ayurveda. I remember at least four patients who have come to me with severe pain abdomen, 20, 30 year olds, they go undo and undiagnosed for a long time and then you test them out and you find that they have been on some Ayurvedic supplements. You send it for testing and you find there's heavy metal, lead poisoning, leading to anemia, liver problems. So that's my problem. Um, if it is properly researched, the contents are displayed properly, the side effects are spoken about, I'm okay with it. What, what, uh, what the health minister is proposing then, uh, is that such a bad idea? If, if it's something that is practiced in, in an institute like, uh, like the AIMS or you think it's too soon for that? Uh, see, the drugs are available across the counter and uh, proper research has to be done, whether it is AIMS or Medanta, whoever is working on it, we need to pick it up, go on a randomized trial and prove that it is beneficial. Okay, so you have those uh, concerns. Dr. Gagadharan, you've heard Dr. Sait's concerns there. In fact, those are concerns, I, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, yeah. other countries have also voiced, uh, I believe in Canada, the issue of, of the, the lead content that you were talking about, for instance, you know, uh, that has been an issue. So, you know, Ayurveda is something clearly that a lot of Indians have uh, faith in, and maybe others as well. Uh, but scientifically, uh, it, it's, it's something that still raises many question marks, Dr. Gangadharan. See, see, let us uh, contemporize the issue. You know? The issue today is that whether a single system is capable of addressing the contemporary needs of the society. It is clear that it is not. And, and globally, when you look at there is a very big effort being taken by people who are working in the frontiers of medical research to look at systems other than biomedical systems that are prevalent. We have not done enough justice to system like Ayurveda to see that how it is effective. We say that there is no evidence. I should say there are lakhs and lakhs of evidence which has gone undocumented the way the modern science needs it. And if you look at today's India scenario, even in the in today in the villages of India and in, in institutions of uh, other than government organizations. People are coming and 69, 80% of the population is going to Ayurveda and such Ayurveda system for first reference. That is a fact. Only thing is, for the last 60 years, if you look at the budgetary allotment for Ayurveda or research documentation, it is a less than 1% of the total health budget. So you cannot expect to do things which are expected of a science without funding it. There is not even a single institute in this country at the level of Anand Institute of Medical Science or IIT or IIMs which can get into the core issues, core expectation of Ayurveda. The more work is happening, shamefully, in other countries than India. We are not looking. You look at the areas of funding NIH, you look at the work that's happening in Sweden, so you believe that look there at the work that's much happening in Germany, Germany and other European countries. So, so you're, you're saying the reverse, that there needs to be much, much more funding, funding and much greater support for Ayurveda and, and for the research. But Dr. Seth, you, uh, you wanted to explain those concerns, uh, you know, to Dr. Gangadharan, because he's saying, and as I think Dr. Thir is also no. saying that there are lacks of people in this that. country on a daily basis who believe in Ayurveda and who and for whom this does Using work Ayurveda. for them. See, you know who they, they you know yeah. it works for people you know and see, it's also their Ayurveda, first choice. Ayurveda has been in use for about 5,000 years but where is the science behind it? We know that a lot of people are taking the medication but whether they are getting improvement on their own or the medicine is working, what are the side effects? We need to do lots more before we can actually prescribe it or integrate it into my system of medicine. See, some of the concerns are correct. The health minister's proposal to push the health minister's... So, you have seen the debate. You know, it's all focused on, you know, uh, people are looking at the need for evidence, need for safety studies, and and then only we can accept. There is kind of a, a, a chauvinistic approach, if you look, that people are asking about and making you know, their, their claims and are trying to um, you know, identify with the lacuna, the weaknesses, and so on and so forth. However, there are a few situations where the people have uh, are making a certain so-called strong uh, the scientific evidences based on clinical practice also is one such example I just wanted to show you here is about the claims for coffee's health benefits. 
we have seen that coffee has been debated for a long time that it's good and bad and so on and so forth here you can hear what this uh, uh, this uh, hepatologist talking about uh, from the uh, school of dr coffee. chopra you spoke about and wrote in your books that coffee is one of the most important protectors of health could you please expand on your idea and talk about the coffee's effect for health yeah it's a great question so as you mentioned i'm a liver expert and i got very intrigued about 25 years ago when i read that coffee drinkers have low levels of liver enzymes in the blood so when we go see our primary care physician once a year they do a battery of blood tests and amongst them they test for two liver enzymes alt and ast and this was an observation that people who drank coffee had lower levels when somebody has elevated levels it's almost always indicative of liver disease so this was intriguing but what does it mean maybe there's something in coffee that interferes with the assay and so you get lower levels but then studies came out that coffee drinkers have less hepatic fibrosis they have less scar tissue in the liver if there's lots of scar tissue in the liver totally distorting the liver architecture with islands of liver cells totally surrounded by scar tissue fibrosis we call it cirrhosis so coffee drinkers had lower levels of liver enzymes they had less fibrosis then a study in gastroenterology that people who drank two cups of regular coffee a day had a 50% reduction in hospitalization and mortality from chronic liver disease it turns out that primary liver cancer cancer arising in the liver is now the third leading cause of cancer mortality in the world and multiple studies and a meta analysis have shown that people who drink two cups of regular coffee 40% reduction in primary liver cancer mortality so less lower liver enzymes less scarring less fibrosis less hospitalization less mortality less liver cancer it turns out that coffee drinkers also have a lower risk of four other common cancers metastatic prostate cancer colon cancer skin cancer including malignant melanoma very deadly skin cancer and endometrial cancer so five cancers people who drink coffee have a low incidence low risk of parkinson's disease low risk of cognitive decline early dementia low risk of type 2 diabetes and for type 2 diabetes one has to drink 6 cups of coffee regular or decaf and then there's a 40 to 54% reduction in risk of developing type 2 diabetes if somebody already has type 2 diabetes and they drink 2 cups of coffee a day regular or decaf 30% reduction in cardiovascular mortality so pretty impressive there are mechanistic explanations coffee drinkers have low levels of crp low levels of tnf alpha improves and reduces the inflammation. inflammation yeah that may be the mechanism where it decreases many conditions uh, the risk of developing them or even cancer which we now know is linked with inflammation c reactive protein uh, is a very sensitive indicator of inflammation true so true So a study appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine about 4 years ago. Uh and that day I got about 100 plus emails from colleagues around the country. Sanjeev you've been talking about coffee all these years and its potential health benefits. You're vindicated. And the study in the New England Journal of Medicine that said men and women who drink coffee have lower total and cause specific mortality. and then about 6 8 months ago an article in one of the nutrition journals that people who drink coffee have longer telomeres so telomeres were described by elizabeth blackburn an australian scientist she got the nobel prize in medicine or physiology in 2009 with two other colleagues and shortened telomeres are linked with accelerated cellular aging so who has shortened telomeres mothers of chronically disabled children caregivers of people with alzheimers who has longer telomeres and by inference they may live longer we think they live longer people who exercise people on the mediterranean diet people who meditate and then the recent study that people who drink coffee have longer telomeres does it matter which coffee to drink how much coffee one should drink and what is the frequency that the coffee yeah. should be used so it's a great question um 
The studies have simply asked, do you drink coffee, yes or no? If you drink, how many cups do you drink? And what is the size of the cup? And do you drink regular or decaf? My take on it is that if drink regular coffee if you can, it has more benefits than decaf. And don't add cream or sugar substitutes. Um, I'd like to drink it black, make it simple then I don't have to worry about sugar and splendor and do I put milk and is the milk cold and it's going to make my coffee cold. So I drink black coffee. If somebody wants to sweeten it, add sugar. Don't use artificial substitutes. Artificial sugars are turning out to produce worse glucose intolerance because it actually changes the microbiome in the GI tract. This is one of the hottest topics in medicine. <clears throat> Microbiome, it's been called the second human genome, the inner bacterial rainforest. There are trillions of bacteria in our GI tract. In aggregate, they weigh three pounds. It's a newly discovered organ. So if you want to have a Coca-Cola, have a Coca-Cola. Maybe have one third, savor it, enjoy it, rather than have a Diet Coke, which has only one calorie, but actually has many injurious health effects. So you have seen that uh, he's talking high about coffee and all that benefits, including as coffee is said to be as a resina because it increases the telomere length and so that people will live longer. But later you find that uh, in one of the systematic review in a journal of food science and nutrition, consumption of coffee or caffeine and serum concentration of inflammatory markers, you find that the authors conclude the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory responses to caffeine, both point to its complex effect on inflammatory response. Now there is a conflict. It is both pro-inflammatory as well as anti-inflammatory. So what is right? Then they have identified saying, I mean, the, the, the dialogue and the discussion goes, if so, why does coffee, caffeine seems to affect everyone so differently? So that finally it comes to what is known as the, the, the DNA that lies within us, a gene called as uh, CYP1A2, um, is also known as caffeine gene, caffeine gene, determines how quickly we metabolize caffeine or not. So it doesn't mean that everyone gets the effect on a similar way. So looking at this, what comes to the mind is to get that evidence, you know, there are claims, that's a hepatologist claim, it's one of the uh, famous uh, medical schools in um, uh, in Boston, the Harvard Medical School, which is considered to be like a, a, a very important uh, institute in the world, medical institute in the world. But still, with his experience, he's talking about and his observations and added into that it is the science behind it. But whereas we you find, then there is a, a reason that we need to understand what makes the difference. There is what is known as individual's response. So that individual's response is a very critical here rather than what evidences that we have. But having the evidences are very important for us to go into the details and to the, um, you know, the depth of the knowledge. This is a very similar to a situation wherein people talk in different ways, different views, and, you know, uh, every popular saying in uh, Rig Veda, you know, ekam sad vipraha bhuta vadanti. So when they described, you know, elephant and uh, six blind men, how do they describe that? The truth is one, truth exists, but how these different people talk in different ways and it looks from a different angle. So these different ways of looking at it is very important for us to give some leads that we can take it further and enhance our knowledge. And that's how Ayurveda was also built from ages. There was a, a US team, USFD had sent a, a six member team. They were all the top uh, medical specialists of uh, uh, top universities in the US. And uh, the, the David Eisenberg, the top guy uh, who has participated in many of those publications, um, uh, which actually was bringing down, pulling Ayurveda. You know, Ayurveda had, um, Ayurveda drugs have got heavy metals and so on and so forth, which made a hue and cry. So they all came to India to understand where is the evidence for Ayurveda. So he has his observation, a robust research effort in this domain also seems warranted, that is, which is required because the Ayurvedic diagnostic approach has a true value. See, look at this, how he has appreciated 
the approach has a true value and could inform allopathy community about subgroups of selected patient population. That's very, very important. How do we arrive at this uh, uh, very established diagnostic approach with evidence? But whereas when it comes to the, the plants, the drugs, the mechanism of action, quality of assurance, and so on and so, on, so forth, quality uh, uh, QA, as we talk about quality assurance, the little evidence that they find, and then little evidence in strategic partnering also of different disciplines coming together that we need to establish uh, the evidence for Ayurveda. But what is most important, uh, the observation that he made was, whatever the, uh, the Ayurveda intervention, which is documented, the lot of research that uh, the at postgraduate level and uh, different institutes does, um, on uh, the natural course of a serious disease, this should be noted uh, to the in the form of a best case studies and such observations have to be published in international medical journals. So as I was telling you, publish or perish, publication is uh, you know, very, very important um, uh, uh, a phenomenon and responsibility of all of us that uh, until unless it is done, um, uh, the, the evidence will not be existing and the people will not be able to recognize. In this context, what uh, uh, the Prime Minister, um, Mr. Narendra Modi had uh, in his, uh, I think, valedictory address of the sixth uh, World Ayurveda Congress uh, in Delhi uh, in 2014 happened. You know, this is a very important noteworthy of the lines that he said. Please listen to this. उसका यह महात्मा रखा गया है और मूल से लेकर के फल तक प्राकृतिक संपदा का कोई हिस्सा ऐसा नहीं है कि जो आयुर्वेद में काम ना आता हो मूल से लेकर के फल तक यानी हमारे पूर्वजों ने हर छोटी बात में कितना बारीकाई से उसके गुणों का उसके स्वभाव का उसकी उसका व्यवहार में उपयोग का अध्ययन किया होगा तब जाकर के स्थिति बनी होगी हम उस महान संपदा को आधुनिक स्वरूप में कैसे रखें यह दूसरी चैलेंज में देखता हम यह चाहें कि अब दुनिया संस्कृत पढ़ ले और श्लोक के आधार पर आयुर्वेद को स्वीकार कर ले तो यह संभव नहीं लगता है लेकिन कम से कम उस महान विरासत को दुनिया आज जो भाषा में समझती है उस भाषा में तो कन्वर्ट किया जा सकता है और इसलिए जो इस क्षेत्र में काम करने वाले लोग हैं उन्होंने रिसर्च करके समय देकर के उस प्रकार की इंस्टीट्यूशनल फ्रेमवर्क के द्वारा इन इन विषयों में जो भी शोध हुए हैं उसको हम कैसे रखें एक तीसरी बात है जितने भी दुनिया में साइंस मैगजीन्स हैं जहां पर रिसर्च आर्टिकल छपते हैं क्या हम सब मिलकर के एक मूवमेंट नहीं चला सकते एक कोशिश नहीं कर सकते एक दबाव पैदा नहीं कर सकते एक आयुर्वेद क्षेत्र में काम करने वालों लोगों को शोध निबंध के लिए लगातार प्रेशर किया जाए व्यवस्था का हिस्सा हो उसको दो साल में एक बार अगर प्रोफेसर है या स्टूडेंट है या फाइनल ईयर में है किसी न किसी एक विषय पर गहराई से अध्ययन करके आधुनिक टर्मिनोलॉजी में शोध निबंध लिखना ही पड़ेगा और इंटरनेशनल मैगजीन में वो शोध निबंध छपना ही चाहिए या तो हमें ये कहना चाहिए कि इंटरनेशनल मेडिसिन के जितने मैगजीन है उसमें टेन परसेंट तो कम से कम जगह डेडिकेट कीजिए आयुर्वेद के लिए उनकी बराबरी में हमारे शोध निबंध अलग प्रकार के होंगे लेकिन हमारे शोध निबंध उसके लिए जगह होगी तो दुनिया का ध्यान जाएगा जो मेडिकल साइंस में काम करते हैं कि चलिए भाई ट्वेंटी परसेंट स्पेस उनके लिए हमने हमेशा हमेशा के लिए समर्पित की है तो उस ट्वेंटी स्पेस के अंदर आयुर्वेद से संबंधित शोध निबंध आएंगे तो दुनिया मॉडर्न मेडिकल साइंस के शोध निबंध पड़ती होगी तो कभी कभी नजर उसकी उस पर भी जाएगी और हो सकता है इन दोनों के तरफ देखने का दृष्टिकोण उन साइंस तो इस फैकल्टी को होगा मैं समझता हूं कि आयुर्वेद को नई दिशा देने के लिए वो एक नई ताकत के रूप में उभर सकता है 
So if you look at it, it was uh, a, a very innovative idea that he has asked for 20% of the space in those uh, international journals to be kept exclusively for Ayurveda. And even if this is accepted, you know, how much that we need to uh, develop the, uh, uh, the evidence base for these and then publish them on a regular basis. This evidence-based medicine, as we talk about, let's look at it, what it is. You know, although it is uh, in the late 80s that it was the word coined, uh, the phrase is, and uh, it is uh, defined as the use of the best available experimental evidence to formulate treatment guidelines. So basically, whatever the experiments, whatever the observations that we make, whatever the studies that we make, that need to be um, published and established, that will help actually formulate a treatment guidelines for these diseases, just as the guidelines now being written for a couple of diseases now in India. So this uh, is a very essential because everyone would follow a uniform guidelines for treatment. But why this EBM or evidence-based medicine is required? For three people, basically. One is the medical educators to train students and the residents. That's very important. See, to train the students, give them the confidence that how to practice, what to practice, how effectively that they can establish and show and demonstrate the results. The second by the practicing physicians to stay on the top of new developments. You know, what is, the, what is the latest? What is new? What is different than what we were practicing before? What new things that we need to do? And most importantly is by the insurers, the government regulators and other organizations to evaluate care delivered by the hospitals and clinics. Today, we have NABH accredited Ayurvedic hospitals. If it is so, then the quality of care, Ayurveda care is established only by this help of uh, the guidelines that is developed basis evidence-based medicine. Um, there are five steps in this evidence-based medicine, uh, five A's if you want to ask. If you want to say, the first one is ask a clinical question. So you have to start uh, you know, asking a one uh, clinical question. What is the um, available treatment for X disease? Then start acquiring the best evidence available in any form of evidences. You know, you collect whatever the information is available as said, oral, recorded, documented, whatever. Then you need to analyze that evidence. Is that really worth or is it only biased? Or is it um, uh, you know, established uh, because of uh, one's own interest and love for that subject? Then apply that evidence and see whether it is uh, reproducible. So what's called as making it foolproof. And then finally assess the performance that uh, what is ex uh, exercised subsequently based on the previous evidence that it is true and uh, accurately acceptable. The, the principles in this uh, EBM if you want to consider is the consistency of clinical practice quality. This is very important. What happens, everybody says, you know, there's something called as um, people in the uh, group of uh, uh, the different states. For example, today, what has happened is Panchakarma is Keraliya Panchakarma is something different than the other North Indian Panchakarma or Panchakarma done elsewhere. So there is kind of a, a, a specialty developed. If it is so, then how this can be employed all over the country and then see establish new methods and that becomes a uniform practice that gives the consistency and quality. And most importantly is the quality of scientific evidence to develop evidence-based practice. So also how uh, important that it is reproducible. It is not just for the, because somebody has observed by chance that was the result and they published and subsequently. That's what we see. Then everybody says that I have treated this disease and that disease, I'm sure it is helpful in a way. But if you ask the, exactly what the evidence that they have got it, very difficult to see. Now, this evidence in Ayurvedic medicine, friends, I want you to make a difference between these two. Everybody is talking about Ayurveda. Just a, a random word. Ayurveda is not a medicine. Ayurveda is a bioscience. It's a biology. Ayurveda is a biology. Okay. So don't say Ayurveda as a generic term. If you want to call it as Ayurveda as a bioscience, that is what is called as the first ever, um, uh, the objective of Ayurveda being first as a first direction, bioscience. That's how, what is this living is all about, how to live, how to live healthy, 
uh, you know, the lifestyle, Dhinacharya, Rupacharya, and so many other things, that is exclusively different. That is for a common man, for a, a, a healthy individual to live. And what is most importantly, everybody jumps on to Che. Ayurveda means biomedical science. What is what I call it as Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic medicine, which is also um, a, a legal term uh, in Drugs and Cosmetics Act, you find it is Ayurvedic medicine, not Ayurveda per se. So Ayurveda is that which encompasses, which is a basic bioscience. Fortunately, feel proud. You know, you are the first on this earth to give this word called as Ayurveda, which is nothing but biology. Biology is hardly 300 years old. 300 years old available on this earth. Bios and Logos, Ayus and Veda, one of the same. And 5,000 years that you have been using this word Ayurveda. We feel proud. So Ayurveda is a bioscience, it's a biology. But what we talk about, and we as physicians that we are discussing now, all of us are physicians, we are not talking to a common man here. So it is this biomedical science that we are talking about Ayurvedic medicine per se. So Ayurvedic medicine which encompasses everything, diagnosis, then progno up to prognosis, treatment, and include medicaments as well as therapies. Okay. When we come to bioscience, the evidence, you know, if you say that the lifestyle, following certain lifestyles, would prevent certain diseases. And you, you, you saw that uh, Dr. Chopra was talking about drinking coffee would enhance, um, uh, you know, uh, the lifespan, if you think. And uh, that's a part of the uh, dietary uh, lifestyle that one could follow, etc. And uh, if that evidence of, how do you get this evidence? By surveys, by you know, looking at observation studies, particularly on a, a very large group around the world and arrive at a, a, a guidelines uh, an evidence saying that if you follow this kind of a lifestyle, then you get uh, the you know you live longer, you prevent diseases, your immunity is high, and so on so forth. One of the important, um, well um, trusted, well evidenced, and well studied such a lifestyle is Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is taught so high about all over the world, and if you look at it, one simple uh, difference I just wanted to uh, give you is what Mediterranean diet what it includes is what is called as a yogurt, what we is called as, unfortunately, that word in English, yogurt, is not the true, the, the dadi, what we talk about. Um, it is a, a different method that this yogurt is made in the Western style. That is not the actually true thing. But whereas that, what made that Greek yogurt, you know, one of the important component of the Mediterranean lifestyle, Mediterranean diet particularly, is considered to be the most healthier one, which improves the gut bio. You have, uh, you have seen recently. The gut biome that this Mediterranean, the, the, the Greek yogurt is talking about, we have already seen that how the Ayurveda talks about the takka is like an amrita on this earth if the amrita was for gods in the heaven. So uh, establishing evidence for lifestyle, everybody understands. That's not a big deal. But when it comes to the, uh, the medicine, particularly the practice of medicine, there are certain questions that are raised. You know, some of the um, uh, you know, popular writers um, uh, our opinion, uh, bring, bring out their views. Uh, and some of them I just wanted to capture here. If you look, what is this? What is their evidence in Ayurveda? Historical, classical, and um, uh, you know, uh, the present nature of clinical practice. Um, the, this is the first evidence that we have, historical. It has been used for 5,000 years, and this is the, the classics that it describes. And a few people who have practiced exactly like that is what is available. So it is like an abstract. The scientific research to support various theories, medicines, and procedures used in Ayurvedic medicine is seldom that is available in, as uh, the Prime Minister was talking about, how people and the world can understand this in an easy uh, terminology. Then coming to clinical practice, the evidence in clinical practice, the, um, the clinical practice of classical Ayurveda is rare. Okay. Very few. You have seen few. Um, if you look at uh, in this uh, Trivida Maushadam uh, webinar, that you found, uh, you know, a couple of uh, the speakers who ha were practicing the so-called truly classical Ayurveda. What is classical Ayurveda as described in the text? But that is very rare. Although huge knowledge and resource and wisdom is available from many books, 
the systematic data and actual use and evidence of reproducible outcomes is not available in public domain that is where it is public for example about public domain at least in the uh, the professional domain also uh, for the available among the physicians the standard treatment protocols for practitioners are not available so uh, it is always that differs from place to place and uh, uh, physician to physician generation to generation as well then the systematic documentation of all these is yes yet the beginning to be made so um, a few efforts have been done but still it is a long way to go when you look at the uh, the scientific evidence for clinical practice so one of the effort that was made by one of the researchers that uh, the, the in the cochrane library cochrane uh, thanks to that uh, guy who brought in uh, a database bringing all the evidences available in one place uh, in the us so there are uh, 7864 systematic reviews systematic reviews is one of the uh, type of uh, evidence that uh, one can get it uh, in medicine so out of the systematic reviews of uh, nearly about 7500 and above the, the he found only one for ayurveda five for homeopathy and 14 for traditional chinese medicine look at this why today traditional chinese medicine is getting popular and then going deep into western uh, practices as well is because of they are establishing publishing scientific evidence this is very very important there are many debates that you know the the for developing this um, uh, evidence the rct model the randomized uh, control trials many people argue that it is not suitable for clinical research in ayurveda yes i will i will come to that in case we can debate it separately but what is available for us at least from nothing at least there have been efforts there are a lot of uh, um, many uh, scientists from other disciplines have contributed uh, to make available certain platforms uh, for ayurvedic people also to use it to establish one is such is ayurvedic biology first to understand what is ayurveda's prakriti is all about ayurveda prakriti not the human prakriti but ayurveda prakriti itself how the the ayurveda as i was telling you the ayurveda bio, ayurveda is nothing but biology so now today you find from this year the jnu is starting a msc bsc and msc on ayurveda biology course look at this there is an a, a interest for everyone to come in to understand this what ayurveda talks about what is life what is living and what are the physiological functions and so on so, so forth then be, it becomes easy for us to extrapolate then um, thanks to this uh, human genome uh, projects then uh, some efforts have been done by indians in establishing ayur genomics because as you saw coffee one says it's good the other one says it's not good caffeine is bad for this guy and so on so then what makes the difference between us so that's what um, if you look at uh, what ayurveda talks about individual is different from each other because of the combinations of this prakriti dosha prakriti and what not many other aspects and all put together captured how to identify that what is the marker to identify the difference so we have got uh, uh, already a platform Uh, available likewise you have whole systems clinical research platform gcp guidelines today the uh, government of india has given for ayurveda cl- uh, clinical studies what is the gcp practices digital helpline is available then ayusoft which is available to make a decision um, you know a support system for making a decision on what the right treatment right method of evaluation to do and so on so forth and then systematic reporting standards are also Uh, made available today so fortunately it is available and we all have to use this and see that we enrich the information into these platforms to make i do the more um, evidence based but what is the focus most of them have done is exclusively on the drugs okay exclusively on ayurvedic medicinal product okay so there have been established methods uh, uh, we at himalaya have been doing it for Uh, several decades and uh, thus we have the credit of es- establishing adding value to this in terms of developing monographs for most of the pharmacopias as well as both india as in india for ayurveda as well as in usp um, which is established that you know first uh, it all starts from the herbs and you know very well in uh, in the in the class of dravigona everyone is talking about what is known as controversial drug adult trend drug 
what is this whether it is in the literature controversy in the material controversy in adulterated materials um, in the market and look alike plants and species and so on so on so forth how do we establish and it is uh, it's not possible as you can see that uh, the 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 nature um, the the strength of nature the quality of the nature and even the 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 width of this nature is dwindling because of the human habitation then the alternative is the cultivation what are the good agriculture practices and then after that how, what are the processing methods in a big uh, uh, process by itself then what is the best method of manufacturing practices um, uh, for these products and then uh, uh, to establishing these pro the standard products made out of gmp which is a, a important norm everywhere in the world uh, they ask for if you have a gmp if you manufacture a product through a gmp gmp is nothing but a, a good evidence based practices of manufacturing products which are batch after batch of the same quality this is very important for us because when this gmp was um, wanted to be imposed in 1997 i still remember an article in lancet in july of 1997 which was published which showed a picture of an ayurvedic pharmacy or a manufacturing uh, unit as a corner with a lot of cobwebs and a suited vessel and a firewood and gunny bags and all that so the contamination forget about all these not uh, ide uh, ideal to look at it but most importantly is about the contamination what happens and what happens to these products if they are contaminated and because it is for a human use for safety reason so very very essential and that's when it, it was emphasized and today we have made some inroads um, uh, to have this uh, um, ayurveda products manufactured under gmp as well so this is well established more or less so industries like us have contributed to a great extent and then we have come to a, a, a good level of evidence but is that not existing at all before was it not the emphasis that ayurvedic literatures made it before when you look at this sentence this paragraph the charaka is talking about the the bheshita pariksha or the aushada pariksha idam eva prakriti evam gunam evam prabhava masmin deshe jatam how much of information that we have to collect and make a monograph including good agricultural practices to the last one establishing evidence as well as Uh, are we not um, having these methods that uh, to establish this have we developed a monograph he gave a format he gave a guideline how to make it was it meant that the true spirit of ayurvedic literature saying that you can manufacture in your own way as you deem fit definitely not then after this is the evidence based practice um, the particularly the clinical practice the learning research and clinical practice being scientific and evidence based is very important and these evidence when you say evidence evidence and everyone says what evidence is a modern evidence it's not an ancient evidence it cannot be considered to be applicable to ayurveda and so on so debate starts i'm sure that a lot of questions would come up but did ayurveda not emphasize on this and if you look very closely friends what he described as pramanas which is actually derived from the so called the other basic sciences of darshanas as you know very well different methods different numbers you know trividha pramana chaturvida pramana and so on and so forth that you find how many types of pramanas being described in indian literature is mind boggling the word pramana if you look uh, equated to the the evidence which means that which obtains accurate and valid knowledge this is very important that is an instrument that which helps to obtain an accurate and valid knowledge pramar pramati pramiti as you call about the about the world he says about anything you know everything in this world that we can take the cognizance of so in short if you translate that pramana is nothing but a testimony a proof or an evidence what are the type of pramanas that you form in all this literature you see pratyaksha is a demonstrative physical evidence anumana inferential evidence upamana analogical evidence shabda or apta vachana verbal or documentary evidence then abhava pratyaksha non perception or negative evidence very very important particularly then uh, arthapatti circumstantial evidence then sambhava a comparative evidence 
very importantly because today we need to compare then aitisha a fallible evidence has been that is also very important e e easily that how it can be fallible then chesta the character evidence that very important the behavioral evidence and so on so forth so look at this pramana the varieties of pramana that the uh, the logical text uh, the darshanas could uh, describe is so endless uh, is it not wise that we need to apply to this but however ayurveda has restricted for its application there are so many other evidences that we need to take in research particularly but for practice what ayurveda literatures have reduced them into four of them sometimes five of them as well pratyaksha anumana upamana and yukti then there is what is known as the anubhava is also what is known as experiential evidence that is also very equally important as you see that physicians have lot of experiences that they need to offer one of the controversies in establishing evidence that you can see which is happening now today exactly today it is happening Uh, uh for the last 24 hours if you uh, uh two two months uh, if you look at it you know this uh, in the present covid uh, everyone is talking about uh, you know treatment with a uh, hcq as a, a very potent one what happened in april uh, on april 22nd this year it was published in lancet that hydroxychloroquine not effective so immediately who jumped and said it is not effective announced to the whole world okay what happened yesterday june 5th both the lancet and new england journal they pulled that controversial paper on hydroxychloroquine risk saying that it is uh, it is not right it was wrongly published i tell you this covid situation has opened up so many truths about what's what's happening what is right to go so the retraction of a research paper is a big big event by itself which has happened just yesterday so uh, you know it is questioned would lancet and ngm retractions happen if not for covid and chloroquine if it was not for this situation was it possible that they would have retracted it maybe not but it is a very critical situation today and then that is withdrawn so what is the right evidence who is following it up every everyone is in a hurry to get that evidence for treatment of this disease which is making this such kind of things happening when we say this published and views etc is said to be uh, what is called as aptopadesha shabda pramana and so on so on so for what the editor you look at this uh, uh, the editor of uh, the hindu is writing the scientific process must be protected from those seeking power and riches this is very unfortunate you cannot venture into because as you can see that ayurveda literature said what if it is called as aptopadesha how authentic it should be i don't want to go into this uh, references of uh, charaka sutra and charaka vimana as you can see that the the when you record an evidence it should be free from all um you know emotions and attachments and things like that. the truth only has to be said a truth has to be made known to the whole world so that's why it is said the people who write this are free from all this rajastamo bhyam nirmukta tapo gyana balena tapo gyana tapo gyana is continuous research deep research observational as well as experimental so what we need to do today to establish this, this evidence evidence friends you know we have uh, when you say a treatment in ayurveda it is of the four forms one is nidana parjana sankshepta kriya yoga nidanam parivarjana if you uh, if you avoid the cause itself is almost uh, in short the treatment so if you have, keep away from the uh, cause itself is the treatment when it is said is that true that we need to establish avoidance of the causative factor or the precipitative factors how true it is this is the cause that's why what is called as elimination studies that happens today and there are a lot of uh, uh, good methods that today we have even uh, genetic methods the molecular genetic methods uh, that you find and what is the cause of the disease in an individual even if you can't find it by uh, uh, routine clinical methods then you have uh, the shodhana and, and then subsequently shamana everyone is talking about shamana um, ayurvedic medicine is only shamana but whereas shodhana 
shodhana is very important and uh, the, the evidence need to be established how exactly is this shodhana how to measure this shodhana how really that happens uh, the removal of the doshas or what is called if, uh, if you want to lose the translate into detoxification and most importantly is the patya vyavastha then what are the dietetics particularly today we have a category what is called as um, therapeutic diet or what is known as um, uh, disease modifying diets um, uh, is a, a regulatory classification as well so um, what are the evidence that we have that these helps as you know we will if patya is the last one if you say if you leave the nidana is almost a treatment and so is also the patya if you follow the patya what is the need for the medicine and if the medicine is taken don't follow patya what is the use of the medicine as you can see so the credible therapeutic modalities in ayurveda need to be evidence particularly panchakarma charasutra rasayana rasayana friends it's very difficult to translate at least uh, you know today um, the, the rasayana has been at least brought very closer to what is known as anti aging anti aging is a word at least very closer to but most importantly the authentic word for rasayana now being used is adaptogenic what is adaptogenic that helps you to cope up with the situation so that is what is uh, the rasayana is all about but however the evidence for all this so anyhow rasayanas have uh, been studied because rasayanas uh, seems uh, to be a medicinal product so there are a lot of uh, uh, studies which have uh, been on the way and have been done as well that you find a lot of information what is the value and uh, uh, role of these rasayanas but most importantly is in the diagnosis when i said first you know their ccrs has got lot of uh, uh, you know data accumulated on prakriti disease prevalence and so on so forth i r actually the department of this nidana and even kaichik is also particularly we have to do lot of uh, such observational um, survey based studies uh, quasi experimental as it is called as that we need to do what is the situation you know the combination that we come into i will come to this uh, Uh, the uh, you know big data into this that ayurveda offers for every diagnosis it's not it's a mind boggling thing it's not so easy that we can think of um you know uh, if you look at this take this only four i've just you know just as a, uh, a showcasing example giving an example for this uh, point to be emphasized i'm showing this but there are many others uh, you know you have clinical methods okay that's not prashna prashna you have dashavida pariksha okay prakriti vikriti sar sambhana etc dasha vidha pariksha that is the 10 points of the drugs to be uh, established for the quality that's about the quality together and then nidana panchaka um, uh, you know hetu uh, puro rupa rupa upashes and prapti this combination this matrix if you look at this it's a big data i tell you because of this human brain unable to comprehend because i uh, know we have not uh, when it is said that ayurveda was absorbed by jnana chakshus dadrashu jnana chakshusa what does it mean by a very ultimate in depth very sharp mind analyzing accumulating all the data together they brought down the ayurveda to uh, this world in the form of literature available to us but for us in this as charaka himself says as the uh, the yuga goes on the strength and capacity comes down in every quarter and so probably we are in the last quarter and uh, that the reason why we are not able to comprehend such a kind of a complex data available and today friends i tell you artificial intelligence is going to take over human brain and artificial intelligence no doubt within fraction of second gives you that combination of analysis that's going to come there are a lot of people who are working in the us universities and this is high time that we also venture a lot of time into this big data analysis uh, i don't want to go to into this that you would have learnt it at the different levels of uh, evidence the clinical studies etc cohort studies etc i am not going to the details of that we need to have this uh, biological evidences and even the, the when you want to conduct a trial what are the Uh, the the typologies different types of data from groups from individuals non experimental experimental observational in, uh, interventional as well that we need to establish and give a comprehensive thing, uh, data for and the type of evidence is also established um, you know national institute of clinical excellence uh, it has brought out uh, of these uh, three uh, these uh, four levels of um, 
uh, evidence that uh, that can be obtained by different types of studies, which I'm not going to go into the details of that. But most importantly, the publication, as you heard, Prime Minister was talking about, there should be an exclusive place, time uh, established for this. And um, if you look, uh, this COVID, thanks to COVID again, it has brought in a lot of processes into the place, thinking um, and, uh, you know, seeing through the information, uh, you know, is one of the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, estimate is, uh, you know, more than 23,000 papers, and that is doubling every 20 days. And 50 million COVID papers by the end of this year, 2020, that you're going to get it. So everybody, whatever that they observe is publishing, 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 and we are nowhere uh, to be lagged behind to publish them. But one of them, when we talk about Prakriti, that, you know, uh, in the nature research, the genome-wide uh, uh, analysis, correlating uh, Ayurveda Prakriti that you can read through this one, which is a very important uh, um, aspect that of the evidence that Prakriti, how it can be analyzed by the, uh, analyzing the human genome as well. But if you look, um, I would uh, request you to see through this uh, a video uh, that Ayush has developed that gives you a spectrum of what are the evidences that have been collated now so far in Ayurveda. Information is everywhere. Nature keeps on broadcasting it through signals. Ancient Indian scholars interpreted these signals with great reasoning and insights, and new knowledge prevailed. One of the most important breakthroughs of the time was the science of natural healing, Ayurveda. Corroborated through the practices of centuries, Ayurveda established Panch Mahabhut Siddha. This grand unifying principle explains that everything in this universe is made of five basic elements ether air fire water and earth constituted in different proportions when combined in pairs the panch mahabhut form tridosha or the three humors based on this panch mahabhut and tridosha the prakriti of an individual evolves. In modern scientific context, the premise of treating a physical disorder on the basis of tridosha has found a very interesting correlation with genomics. In a recent research, it has been found that EGLN1 genetic variations correlates with phenotypic classification between Pitta and Kapha and have been linked to high altitude adaptations and thrombotic outcomes in hypoxia. As has been described in the ancient text of Charak Samhita, the study suggests that the phenotypic classification of India's traditional medicine, Prakriti, has a genetic base. We thought that the principles of Ayurveda, which allows us to stratify individuals, could be integrated with the state of our genomic methods to identify predictive markers which would be useful for early interventions as well as allow us to manage the diseases in a customized manner. As a personalized medical practice, Ayurveda can easily identify, predict and prevent a disease by implementing therapies like Panch Karma. The therapy believes in finding the root cause of the problem and corrects the imbalance of mind, body 
and emotions. The research has shown that the medicine which is given through nasya can actually cross the blood brain barrier. I would say that this is a very advanced technique because nowadays the research is going on to develop the nasal spray for the insulin. The two well established processes of Ayurved, Kasht Aushadhi, the pure herbal preparations. Rasa Aushadhis, the herbal, biomineral, metallic preparations have stood the test of time. Today Ayurved is standardizing its extraordinary rich knowledge of medical herbs to illustrate their quality, safety and efficacy in curing ailments. Bahukalpam, Bahugunam, Sampannam, Yogyam Aushadhi. So all these parameters are really the basic protocol for standardization of medicine. Even after so much of skepticism, Ayurvedic formulations like Bhasma and Rasa Sindur have proved their effectiveness to modern science. A study carried out in Bhabha Atomic Research Center and Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology came out with the conclusion. Our work not only helps to understand the non-toxicity of Rasa Sindhu, but also establishes the Ayurvedic synthesis method for a well-controlled end product. Another laboratory test of Rasa Sindhu on Drosophila showed that the lava fed with this mercuric preparation had better thermotolerance improved size of salivary glands, improved fertility and increased lifespan. The usage of plant materials along with these minerals when it comes to Rashastra, we understand the symbiosis and the strength of symbiosis between the plant materials and the minerals. Both are coming from the nature. They are not different. Herbo mineral preparations are prescribed for certain disease condition but for a short duration of time in a controlled dosage. They are prescribed sometimes in a disease condition to achieve certain clinical endpoints. This is akin to the concept of biomarker based drug delivery that is gaining importance in the modern era of medicine. Ayurveda has described this thousands of years back in the form of Chikitsa Sutra for different stages of disease for the personalized administration of medicine. One of the most important medical discoveries in the 21st century is the role of the microbiome on health and diseases. This is particularly true of the population of the bacteria inhibiting the human digestive system. While we are bringing to comprehend the consequences of the microbiome on the development of a myriad of conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, obesity, etc. Ayurveda understood this relationship between digestive health and diseases and therefore emphasized the gut as the key to longevity, vitality and mental well-being centuries ago. Today we have learned that gut bacteria actually controls diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And this is measurable from your stool test by genomic measurement. Today's understanding of genomics and yesteryears of understanding of Ayurveda has a place to come and converge. Ayurveda talks about Agni and uh, Agni is related to health and health is related to happiness. It is saying in Ayurveda that Sukha Sangyakam Arogyam Vikaro Dukham Evacha. 
from the health to happiness is a journey of an individual and ayurveda talks about that i will practice about that and uh, that is the future today ayurveda is evolving and aligning itself to who mandates with its established predictive participatory and personalized approach The Ministry of Ayush is endlessly endeavoring to spread this unique system of healing by creating a viable ecosystem. With its old premise of constant search for truth and adopting innovations, Ayurveda is set to move forward as ever as an ever evolving science. friends you have seen that uh, what makes uh, having uh, evidences to establish the principles to be recognized and uh, if you look at uh, uh, new uh, thoughts coming out uh, new concepts uh, in the world of uh, science including this bio gut biome and um, you know uh, the other aspect that uh, have been very well captured so there is a lot of scope that ayurveda could add value Uh, the either the knowledge could add value to that and which uh, has been said that always the evidence driven clinical decision is always the ultimate one so as uh, charaka says in his vimanasthana as well in uh, fourth chapter uh, thus you know there are a lot of people uh, have uh, uh, <clears throat> in the mind that how ayurveda can be actually contemporized ayurveda is um, uh, there is no beginning there is no end it is for all the times etc please i i urge all of you to just um, uh, come to this uh, particular statement of charaka which actually describes what ayurveda is and answers most of the questions that comes in the mind nachayiva hasti sutaram ayurveda sya param tasma there is nacha eva hi hasti he has affirmatively said there is no second thought there is no doubt also in his statement sutaram ayurveda sya param there is no limitation for ayurveda don't ever limit ayurveda only to sanskrit only to charaka only to samhita ayurveda is everything because ayurveda is biology okay life science tasmad apramattah shashvat abiyogam asmin gacchet etachcha karyam so beautifully he said what ayurvedic physicians ayurvedic people ayurvedic professionals have to do because it has no limitation there is no end you have to be industrious always to work and work work on this one this is the only the duty of your uh, being a professional ayurveda Yevam bhuyascha vrutta saushtavam. You know, having known this, in order to enhance the professional um, the efficacy, professional um, you know growth, anasu yatha without having any kind of a blockage of the mind. Hey, that is different. That is modern. This is ancient. There is nothing called as ancient modern. Today is ancient for tomorrow. Yesterday is ancient for today. What are you talking about it? So. anasuyata parebhyo api agamaitavyam you have to help, keep that open mind open senses to get this from anybody else krishno because krishno hi loke buddhimatam acharya shatruscha buddhimatam the whole world is a teacher for the wise and enemy for the unwise if one thinks that they are enemy they are westerners they are modern and this and that that's it atascha abhisamiksha buddhimata having seen this the whole world is a teacher for the wise that buddhimata amitrasya api even from a unfamiliar source amitra if you want to translate that into enemy that is a meaning no meaning at all it is unfamiliar so we don't understand that concept is different this concept is different and how can we combine this one amitrasya api dhanyam dhanyam that is going to be more beneficial for people yashasyam brings you the success and fame ayushyam it prolongs the life of your profession ayurveda and the people's life paustikam most thought provoking knowledge most nourishing knowledge for the mind and for the body as well as most importantly friends 
this you have to highlight laukyam what is actually ground reality for the ground the in in the world so it should not be always in 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 different world dreaming about it laukyam abhi upadishato having understood learned and seen heard shrotavyam anuvidatavyam cha iti he says listen to it practice it not listen to it and leave it from here thank you so much i hope i have done the justice if you have any questions please do let me know thank you all the best god bless you thank you sir your last uh, reference uh, was the most apt one required now because uh, after some of like previous speakers and all i think the viewers also would be confused at what has to be done and this gives a solution from our own classics uh, sir we have a lot of questions uh, and uh, uh, i will start it and uh, I, i think you are ready sir for the answers yeah yeah please please go yes first question is from dr mohit how trividham aushadham helpful in cardiac as well as cardiovascular diseases uh well uh cardia cardiovascular okay you have said now i think in the whole three, uh, this seminar for the last six days i think so if i'm not mistaken i will see you know as well as what is cardiac what is hridayam in, in, in ayurveda and where is the site of hridayam if you all come combine all that it gives you a link between this organic heart physical and uh, subconscious mind you know um, cardiovascular is said one of the most uh, uh, problem in the modern times is the hypertension very simple okay even if you look and measure my pressure now at this time point because the last uh, 90 minutes or so 90 93 minutes i was speaking about it and if you look if you measure it will be high obviously because there is an exertion heart was able to pump and mind was able to think and the whole system is just churning out and so on so the heat is generated or the energy is generated and the energy naturally has its effect on vessels okay at that time what is required it is not any of your um, you know uh, uh, treatment for hypertension there are eight drugs i tell you that there is hardly any cardiologist in this on this earth who can ever identify the right uh, drug for the right uh, patient having all of them having hypertension only all above uh, 120 only minimum of uh, millimeter of uh, mercury so if you if you look at that what we need is that artificial intelligence would, would differentiate whether this guy needs uh, ac2 inhibitors or beta blockers or whatever it is or uh, sarpaganda or ashwagandha or any other okay so what matters is the three of them trividha aushada one is yukti yukti is what i was talking about all about the drugs that is very applicable the second one is most importantly is uh, sattva avajaya what is sattva avajaya very simple uh, and i think uh, the second lecture on yoga uh, uh, was uh, demonstrating about pranayama the science of pranayama if you have somebody would have followed it uh, you would understand better, better and even if now don't do anything even my if you measure my pressure is high and then you just close your eyes and then go for the pranayama i tell you i assure you i have measured it i have seen i have demonstrated it this that by doing the pranayama controlling the mind what is pranayama is with the controlling the mind so if you control the mind you will see that it falls back into normal much lower than normal i tell you i can assure you so that sattva avaja is very important sattva avaja means not always the dhairya smriti vijnana this is what knowledge is to understand that you don't have to do anything sit and relax and breathe you get bring it down most importantly after all these three there is a situation what is called as um, um, even i can't concentrate i can't do a pranayama well i can't do this uh, you know um, take a medicine that's not effective at all you know you have seen that you know over a period of time prescribers keep on changing the drug people go in for what is known as if i can't control this go on sit and chant whatever the mantra you want to chant mantra singing mantra singing is a big big practice mixed with yoga merged with yoga in in the western countries what i have seen seen is even in germany mantra singen is you know is a big program is a prescription also you have to follow every thursday at 4 o'clock mantra singen the patient has to go 
So um, if you do that, uh, what, what I want to call it is Daiva Vipashraya. So uh, looking at something, a uh, uh, super uh, uh, you know, uh, force that is helping us to calm down the mind. Again, it works through uh, all the taxes. I don't want to go to the science of this. Definitely, all the three of them will help uh, to overcome this problem that uh, haunting the heart particularly due to all this. As you know very well today, we in this uh, modern, what you call rat race busy. Uh, fortunately, COVID has put all of us to rest. For three months, everyone is relaxed. Look at this. Many people have even increased weight. Many people also very sensibly have reduced the weight. Okay, Both of them, th uh, things have happened. So who has done judiciously is what that matters. And all the three of them are very useful, particularly in the heart disease. I assure you, you are, will be successful if you apply all the three of them. Sir, I, and next question from Dr. Mohit only. I think uh, from the video on uh, coffee, uh, not from Dr. Mohit, sorry, from two of these uh, viewers uh, on uh, coffee, uh, one from uh, Yashaswani, uh, what is the relation that uh, using caffeine reduces the risk of dementia? What is the? What is the risk? Huh? What is the? Uh, what is the relation that using huh. caffeine huh. reduces the risk of dementia? The video from. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it is the observation. You know, the caffeine um, has uh, uh, it's a stimulating activity, particularly on um, activating um, the brain. Uh, so that's what we people say. You know, if you drink coffee before going to bed, you, you will not get sleep. You will be always active and. Um, alert, awaken. So this awakening actually probably, I am not too sure what this experience is all about. What I think probably would have happened is that it helps to improve the circulation to the brain. So when the circulation happens to the brain, obviously it is going to be. And uh, that is one. The caffeine has got uh, two approaches also. Caffeine is also an antioxidant, which is coming up now. Even in uh, tea also has got an amount of uh, caffeine. But the ratio of caffeine in coffee and tea is what that matters the difference. That's why Green tea is said to be more antioxidant because of that level control and uh, conditions of the caffeine, which is also um, uh, antioxidant. There are many other uh, ingredients. You know, as you know very well, uh, it's not only one uh, active ingredient that matters in a, a natural ingredient. Uh, coffee also, a lot of polyphenols that also help to be um, antioxidant as well. So that antioxidants are very well known. That's the same mechanism that uh, turmeric also was helping uh, the, in dementia. Yeah. Next question from uh, Raju Dodmani. What is the role of caffeine which is present in the coffee? Oh. I don't know. I couldn't make uh, out. Yeah, yeah. There are, uh, there are plenty of them. And, uh, I, I, can, I can urge you, you can uh, just uh, search the uh, internet that you will get a lot of them, uh, including the positive and negative, and uh, particularly uh, with regards to their, even in uh, as much as I was baffled to see after this Dr. Chepra was talking about, uh, the benefits of coffee. Um, I, I don't know. There are a lot of uh, situations that how much is this evidence valid is what that uh, it has to be evaluated. I am doing that now. But uh, at the moment, prima facie, if you look at it, it, it appears as if uh, coffee uh, is a very good drink, probably. Yes. Next question is by Professor Dr. Jagdish Giritamanavar. He is asking, uh, he has asked two questions. First one Ayurveda is Shashwata. Then why to give evidence to present medical science whose fundamental principles are different? Mm -hmm. Sir, can you throw light? Yeah, I think the, my last but one slide before thanking you has answered this, I suppose. Yes. And second question is, is it viable to look Ayurveda research through modern spectacles? How is it, how it is justified? <laughs> the same thing. Answer is the same thing. So, Charakas, Vibhanasthana, 8th chapter, 13th shloka. Please analyze every word there, which is very close to my heart, which is the only way for us to move forward on this earth. And that Charaka said, that death. So please don't limit yourself. As I told you, what is ancient is yesterday. And today is ancient for tomorrow. Tomorrow is future for today. So what are you talking about? It's a time. You cannot restrict anything to. So when it is said that uh, Shashwata, when he said, why, why does it, what does it mean? It is always, there is no limitation. So, you know, this um, gut biome is Ayurveda, anything is Ayurveda, anything is lifestyle, anything that you talk about, don't bring in the making an aeroplane is Ayurveda. Aeroplane is a engineering, it's a machine. 
if there is life in engineering what is called as bioengineering uh, then is ayurveda so ayurveda is life science please don't limit itself to only practicing human ayurveda what about plant ayurveda vriksha ayurveda what about animal ayurveda uh, pashu ayurveda are there not ayurveda also for animals veterinary science and today uh, about you know the organic cultivation that are, what you are talking about is not a plant ayurveda uh, you know vriksha ayurveda and so on so forth everything is ayurveda as long as life is involved all the, all the three forms human beings animals and whatever that you classify the dravyas into uh, those which move and uh, uh, those who don't move they, they are not uh, having life so that's why they are not ayurveda the rest of them where there is ayu the life that is ayurveda uh, next question is, is by dr girish danappa gowder sir is it viable to look ayurveda research through modern spectacles how is it justified it is kind of same question already which has been asked friends friends i want actually all of you join together and take this charakas uh, sutra by heart it by heart it analyze it apply it that is the true picture of ayurveda not anything else that you have read so far next question is by dr ashwini lavanya ayurveda is a science which deals with individual specific therapeutic modalities in this case how can we substantiate the research in ayurveda to the research tools in modern medical science i think if you have a closely view the video i'm so sorry it took a long time for all of you to watch this carefully because many of you probably would have distracted from uh, being very heavy uh, to give you the information to which one of them if you three p4 medicine is what is coming up friends understand p one of them is personalized personalized medicine is what exactly ayurvedas what 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 did he say purusham purusham viksha when he says i describe all the as finally you have to look at each an individual each an individual friends it is impossible for human brain to analyze all the factors to analyze in half an hour in 10 minutes in one hour of consultation that you make with the patient to arrive at the exact picture of him and give right medicine for him or a therapy even whatever that four modalities i said what are the nidanas to be eliminated what are the shodhana therapies that you have to prescribe and what are the shamana as well as patya to make it sooner than later you are getting the tool what is called as ai in ayurveda ayurveda yeah, artificial intelligence which will give you in press of a button entire profile and that will be a personalized medicine and that is the future coming okay so that is what is the, uh, the available thing already uh, some of the the big um, uh, the, the uh, manufacturers have started in um, uh, in in the west particularly for other, uh, the modern drugs uh, the, what is called as the conventional medicine and um, in that how you know who is responding to uh, uh, instead of you know trial and error everything we have been seen in our practice always trial and error give this one if it works fine it worked but if you ask me after that you sit back and say uh, this may be the rational but if it does not work you will look for the alternative so now we is coming up that is the age of personalized medicine purusham purusham viksha is coming that is just uh, the principle that ayurveda even today for future and this is an, another example to show ayurveda shashwat and sutaram param nachai vai hasti yes sir dr vijay who was our guest speaker and your student ah. he yeah. has answered uh, like he has commented and he says to respond to the most commonly asked question as to how research could be done at opd level one of the best solutions is pbrn practitioner based research network yes pbrn yeah i will just uh, continue with another question by dr bharati thank you dr vijay thank you dr vijay for answering on my behalf dr bharati purohit she has asked two questions one of it is uh, do you recommend any protocol for specific diseases for clinical research at opd level in ayurveda hospitals as well as private clinics uh, um, uh, you know i am sorry that i could not go through that because of the want of time of the different methods and modalities of uh, evidence uh, developing evidence on what are the types of uh, studies that we can do they have the observational and then quasi uh, uh, experimental and then uh, even uh, the clinicals particularly that uh, one short slide i just move, move them fast uh, to understand so i know if you write particularly i will let you know so there are uh, possibilities the institutional research clinical research on a, a big uh, plan and 
program and the protocol to be right written and those who can uh, particularly from practitioners that the who can do and uh, please wait sooner than later uh, we are coming out with uh, the approaches and um, uh, the, the apps that would help you to um, uh, you know, do document and then subsequently um, pull all that in a central place wherein that helps as a uh, developing guidelines for other uh, the future physicians to follow next question by her is how ayurveda practitioners can do research at opd level any help coming from ayurveda pharmaceuticals yeah that's what i was telling you so yeah. the basis this artificial intelligence see the certain apps should uh, be made available so then later that would help to um, you to feed and pull in that information so that uh, it will be that big data will be analyzed to get, get, give you back the the guidelines that can be that's uh, that's happening so we have to wait it's happening now fortunately you are at the uh, the edge of uh, things to happen in future um sir uh, another of your student dr sudhindra deshpande uh, he no they are all my teachers i am only the student of all of them yes <laughs> uh he has uh, told in continuation of dr vijay's um, uh, statement that protocol for pbrn need of the r sir your comments please yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know that, that's where uh, uh, the I, i was telling you that's one of the uh, pre uh, precursors for this ai is talking about um, wherein we can uh, join together to pool our um, observations and then all our evidences that's available together so that can be collated in one place and that actually enlarges the volume of the uh, evidence available to us and that uh, will uh, guide us for the future uh, practices and generation sir dr bharti purohit she has answered like she has uh, given her comment on what you were uh, answered for the first question related to the cardiovascular diseases trividham aushadham application mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she i think uh, she is in yoga uh, samsthana uh, vyasa kalyana so oh, she yeah. has uh, we are giving msrt as special yoga therapy for all ncd where mahamrutyunjaya mantra is given for chanting along with om uh, thank you so much uh, bharti ji for adding value to that uh, information that everybody will be benefited now Dr. Savita Bhaskar, she is. Uh, she said also, what research can be carried out at OPD level, and how or where do you update it? Is there any site available for? Thank you. Yeah, that's what the previous one was the answer yeah. to that. So uh, you can look at it. So we will. Um, uh, I mean, the uh, this institute now, the Rajiv yeah. Gandhi Education Society's uh, Department of Kai Chikitsa. can be a nodal agency wherein they can pull all these uh, the programs together and then start helping networking the people together so the please keep in touch and stay with this uh, this network sure, so it will be sure noted sir um uh, uh, our professor from department of kai chikitsa dr shiv kumar c sarvi sir is asking one question what do you say about indriya sthana of charaka regarding arishta lakshana that's a great question in fact uh, i uh, commend uh, professor uh, i'm sorry mr sarvi dr sarvi dr sarvi yes so, professor sarvi uh, in fact uh, your question is so apt actually which has uh, baffled me for all to my ages so far is this indriya sthana is one uh, section of charaka samhita but all the ayurveda colleges i the students who study charaka samhita wants to eliminate it you know they want to jump it out for the very reason that it does not give you um, any direct uh, uh, recommendations or advices to uh, diagnosis treatment and so on but actually that is the most critical one that's the most critical uh, part the charaka is that's a speciality of charaka not even sushta and others who are able to do that is the one how do you come to a prognosis today even in the covid situation also if you look um, you know there is a symptomatic asymptomatic who is symptomatic who is am symptomatic and who is symptomatic goes to the third phase of uh, uh, chronic um, and, uh, 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 acute uh, stage acute phase and who cannot go some of them you know 
uh, there, there are a lot of feedback saying that ah, i took only paracetamol and then went off on four days and came out and i'm okay there's nothing to be feared about and others who have done everything a to z but still landed up in um, you know uh, need for uh, ventilators and so on and so forth so and even success as uh, so, um, i mean uh, recovered and even after discharge at the, uh, the the door of the hospital they collapsed and died so that's also there so how do we profess this how do we prognose uh, establish a prognosis early if we have developed that this whole indra sanas that i think eight chapters are there but if you um, if you absorb the, uh, the science behind that you will be a great physician to say early how you can help them to save or where you can see that you know it will be a bad progress so establishing the prognosis possible or not possible many a times what happens everyone wants to venture to give the treatment and all are not successful definitely so how can you predict that the rate of success indrasana is a success great sir next uh, comment uh, question is from dr yoganand you again one of your student well, sir yeah. apart from sir. research and evaluation for himalaya products had himalaya healthcare done any research evaluation and documentation for classical products now we have been uh, in always uh, the, the second one uh, uh, dakan uh, section 3h ayurveda proprietary medicine right from the beginning uh, um, making proprietary products so uh, we have not uh, uh, you know done anything except for uh, chaman prash chaman prash is the only Uh, the authentic one uh, as per uh, Karaka's uh, formula is the Ayurvedic medicine to say, um, uh, particularly. So the other, um, uh, the Ayurveda medicine, the three A definition. So we have not into. Uh, sir, I think here ends the questions. Sure. Thank And, you so much. Uh, I can't uh, collect the names of your students who have said. No, 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 no. <laughs> thanks to all of them. So kind of them. Thanks for. Uh, uh participating in this one thanks for being uh, and thanks for your encouragement and uh, support thank you so much and thanks sir, professor sir i thank you very much really? and uh, before know. we conclude uh, i would uh, request um, dr balikai sir professor department of rasa shastra and vaishya kalpana from uh, our uh, college institute rajiv gandhi uh, education society ayurvedic medical college to deliver vote of thanks Sir, Bali, guys. Yes, madam. Good evening, all. So special uh, good evening to Rangesh Parmesh, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, we have shared a lot of time with us, and uh, it's my immense pleasure to thank you, sir. So it's my immense pleasure to present my word of thanks to you on behalf of uh, uh, staff, you. management, and students. I heartily gratitude and present my thankful to you, sir. So, thank Dr. You. Rangesh Parmesh, sir, thank so you, chief sir. scientific officer and uh, Himalaya. global management limited uh, dif is dubai uae that is the uh, united arab emirates sir so evidence based uh, ayurvedic medicines was a very nice uh, presentation sir by you it's very useful for all the delegates of the national international level sir so once again i am very much thankful you on the off of our management staff and students sir so this is my gratitude and thankful to all my organizers and uh, all uh, our president sir special thanks to Dr. C. G. S. Patil Sir, ex MLA and President of uh, Rajiv Gandhi Education Society, is our medical college, Rone. So I am very much thankful to our chairman, our president, sir, who have allowed us to organize a beautiful webinar of, on uh, Trivedam Aushadam as a international one. So I am very much thankful, Dr. C. G. S. Patil Sir. So also I am very much thankful to our chairman, Rajiv Gandhi Education Society, our medical college, Sir I. S. Patil Sir, who have allowed to conduct this type of international webinar to. provide the knowledge to worldwide sir so also i am very much thankful to our secretary who have ever always supported us for our uh, uh, conducting lot of seminars so i am very much thankful to dr k b dhanur sir who have uh, helped lot of things for supporting and organizing this international webinar sir so i am thankful to dr k b dhanur sir so also so also i am very much thankful to our beloved principal sir dr ib kotrashetty sir who is always backbone for us for conducting thank this you, uh, this type of seminar sir so it's very very much uh, uh, pleasurable moment that i am very much by, by heartly i am uh, thankful to our principal sir always he is encouraging us to conduct this type of webinars and also seminars to the uh, worldwide for to get the benefits of the students sir so also i am very much thankful the chief organizing uh, secretary uh, dr sharda madam she always active and always even though she is a senior she is always active and actively participated 
and she has lost like a lot of for the conducting of this type of uh, international webinar for the providing knowledge of international students and also for the people of who in the present um, covid era so i am very much thankful to the other uh, <coughs> organizing secretaries uh, dr anandadi sir and uh, dr shukumar sarvi sir so those are also have contributed uh, in the conducting this uh, type of uh, uh, international webinar so also i am uh, very much thankful to our scientific uh, committee coordinator dr shashikala bani madam she has standard she has supported for to conduct this type of international webinar for the providing uh, for the students so also i am very much thankful to the coordinator of kaichikitsa department dr anapurna dambar and also dr ragvender shatter so they also have contributed for the organizing this type of uh, international webinar for this uh, successful uh, webinar sir so at last i am very much thankful to additional technical supporters mr gishnu and his team for the technical cooperation for this international webinar so without them it is not possible i special thanks to uh, mr gishnu and team so for the supporting a uh, technical assistant to us at last uh, i am very much thankful to all the delegates of national international level so those who have participated to get the knowledge and uh, they have also interrogated with us and uh, to increase their knowledge uh, once again i am very much thankful to all the delegates who have joined in this international webinar so also i am also thankful to those people who have contributed their uh, support to the organizing this type of international seminar so i once again thanks to all the uh, one and all who have contributed their support in the conducting this international seminar thank you one and all and thank thanks you, again thank you thank you thank you thank you bye thank you thank you thank you balikai sir for your uh, uh, vote of thanks um before concluding i would just like to share a very happy moment that at this right time our college esteemed college is able to go live in uh, two departments one is uh, this which is uh, going to end of course uh, department of pg studies in kaichikitsa and simultaneously pg uh, studies in uh, prasuti tantra and sri roga is live on facebook so two departments going live Uh, for the sake of students and the learners of ayurveda it is really a great yeah. achievement from our college that to basically where our college is located is very remote wherein the internet facilities is also very poor so in spite of that all the hurdles we are we were able to uh, reach to this uh, um, juncture so for that i should thank our uh, technical team uh, jishnu very much and uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, last lecture would be from professor uh, venugopalan sir from chennai uh, jayendra saraswati institute of ayurveda medical college uh, chennai and uh, he will be talking on a very different topic yet in the trividham aushadham that is daiva pashay chikitsa with a special reference to mani and mantra so that it's that also would be definitely informative and very interesting kindly request all the viewers to stay tuned sir thanks a lot thank, my thank pranam you. sincere pranam samar pranam sri and pranams to all the viewers on youtube thank you thank you thank you madam